O oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasu, O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead, so for my respectful base, it is unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestation. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitravutra Paramo Nimatsinam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atravastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Imad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Imva Purir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra Kriti Bihi Susu Subis Dakshanat Completely rejecting all, all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the, mature, the, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam phalam Nukamukad amrita dravya samyatam Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam Muhur ahuraska bhuvibhavu kaha O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. Shima, the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. 
although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svatkata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Periyantak Stoli Bhadrani Vidu Nati Suhit Satam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nastapresu Badresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Utama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki. In this way, a devotee develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. Sorry. In this way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant uh, his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of, of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo kama loba dayas chaye chete tari navidam stitvam satve prasidati by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogitaha bhagavat tattva vigyanam muktasanga sajayate when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfect. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasamsaya shiyante chashikarmani Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagra. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, we're gonna. I think we want to go over this purport. Yes. Oh, it's all right. We'll go for it. Text, uh, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Text 32. Nishamya Bhagavan Margam Samstamya Dukulasyacha Swapataya Matim Chakre Nebritatma Yudhisthira. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Upon hearing of Lord Krishna's returning to his abode, and upon understanding that the end of the Yadu dynasty, uh, the end of the Yadu dynasty's earthly manifestation, Maharaj Yudhisthira decided to go back home, back to Godhead. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj Yudhisthira also turned his attention to the instructions of Bhagavad Gita after hearing about the Lord's departure from the vision of earthly people. He began to deliberate on the Lord's way of 
of Appearance and Departure. The mission of the Lord's appearance and disappearance in the mortal universe is completely dependent on his supreme will. He is not forced to appear or disappear by any superior energy, as the living beings appear and disappear. Being forced by the laws of nature, whenever the Lord likes, He is not forced to appear or disappear by any superior energy as the living beings appear and disappear, being forced by the laws of nature. Whenever the Lord likes, he can appear himself from anywhere and everywhere without disturbing his appearance and disappearance in any other place. He is like the sun. The sun appears and disappears on its own at any place without distributing at any place without disturbing its presence in other places. The sun appears in the morning in India without disappearing from the Western Hemisphere. The sun is present everywhere and anywhere all over the solar system. But it so appears that in a particular place, the sun appears in the morning and also disappears at some fixed time in the evening. The time limitation, even of the sun, is of no concern. And so, what to speak of the Supreme Lord, who is the creator and controller of the sun? Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that anyone who factually understands the transcendental appearance and disappearance of the Lord by his inconceivable energy becomes liberated from the laws of birth and death and is placed in the eternal spiritual sky where the Vaikuntha planets are. There are the, there such liberated persons can eternally live without the pangs of birth and death, old age. In the spiritual sky, the Lord, and those who are eternally engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord are all eternally young because there's no old age and disease and there's no death. Because there is no death, there is no birth. It is concluded, therefore, that simply by understanding the Lord's appearance and disappearance in truth, one can attain the perfectional stage of eternal life. Therefore, Maharaj Yudhisthira also began to consider going back to Godhead. The Lord appears on the earth or any other mortal planet along with his associates who live with him eternally. And the members of the Yadu dynasty who were engaged in supplementing the pastimes of the Lord are no other than his eternal associates. And so also Maharaj Yudhisthira and his brothers and mother, etc. Since the appearance and disappearance of the Lord and his eternal associates are transcendental, one should not be bewildered by the external features of appearance and disappearance. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jay. So, uh, Krishna, uh, Shila Prabhupada is mentioning and affirming over and over again the fourth chapter, ninth verse of Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Chame Divyam, Ivam Yoviti Tatvata, Yakva Deham Punar Janma, Naiti Mam Eti Sarjuna. And this verse, Krishna says, anyone who understands the transcendental nature of my appearance and disappearance does not apply on leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. But this is an extremely important verse, and Prabhupada has uh, quoted it many times in this purport and in this chapter. And it's a fact. And here he's giving a lot of information of why we should accept this verse as extremely important. Because understanding the transcendental nature of Krishna's pastimes, especially his appearance and disappearance, correctly, not misinterpreting it, one is liberated. That's how powerful knowledge of Krishna is. One is liberated forever from the cycle of birth and death. 
And we see someone like uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira, if they're hearing about Krishna's disappearance and the other dynasties' disappearance, he became very thoughtful and decided it's time for me also to leave this temp temporary material body and go back to where I belong. Now, most people, uh, I have personal experience, I had an uncle who was dying. And the, the doctor was, a doctor was called. The doctor came with a stethoscope and his little bag of, uh, of goodies. And uh, he took the pulse and he put the stethoscope on different parts of the body of my uncle. And then he looked at, uh, you know, the people there and he shook his head like that. He took, uh, put the stethoscope and all, all his goodies back into his uh, little bag and was going to walk away. In other words, basically indicated with his shaking his head that there's nothing I can do. And then my uncle grabbed his hand, you know, and wouldn't let go. He said, doctor, I need another four years. The doctor just pulled his hand away. <laughs> it was like shocking experience. So here we see that at the moment of death, people want to live some more in the material body and suffer. But we should learn from our Yudhisthira. He realized that, okay, Lord's manifest pastimes in this world are over. I've performed my duty of passing the whole kingdom on to Maharaj Brikshit. There's no more, nothing else I can do. Therefore, I'm going to focus on going back to where I belong, the spiritual world. I saw this also once. Uh, there's a very well known devotee, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. He was dying of cancer. And at one point, uh, his close associates told him, Look, uh, you don't have much time left. Stop doing all these darshans and kirtans and just focus on going back to Godhead. And you, you can go on the internet, you'll see the last lecture he gave. He was actually crying when he was giving it. But he said, he told the devotees, now um, I've, it's been advised that I just focus on Krishna and, and prepare myself to leave the body. And it's a very, uh, you know, touching uh, lecture that he gave. And that was it. He went into some kind of a seclusion and, and the devotees were simply reading and chanting with him all the time, and he left his body. So basically, uh, we can see that real devotees and great devotees, like Maharaj Yudhisthira, uh, he says that uh, because there's no death, there is no birth, it is concluded, therefore, that simply by understanding the Lord's appearance and disappearance in truth, one can attain the perfectional stage of eternal life. Therefore, Maharaj Yudhisthira also began to consider going back to Godhead. The Lord appears on the earth or any other mortal planet along with his associates who live with him eternally and the members of the Yadu family who were engaged in supplementing the pastimes of the Lord are no other than his eternal associate and so also Maharaj Yudhisthira and his brothers and mother, etc. Since the appearance and disappearance of the Lord and his eternal associates are transcendental, one should not be bewildered by the external features of appearance and disappearance. In other words, don't equate the Lord's appearance and disappearance of those of his pure devotees on an equal level with mundane people who appear and disappear. It's like my uncle. At the moment of death, he's asking for more time. And by the way, why was he asking for more time? Because he wanted to write his autobiography, which no one would have read anyway. You know, it was, a, it was ridiculous. And he wanted four more years to do it. He was like, I think he was like 75 or 76. 
He's wasted 76 years, and now he's asking for four more years, in which he would have wasted also and never finished his autobiography. So the whole thing is ridiculous. It's pathetic. It's sad. It's very heartbreaking to see such ignorance. But we should learn from these experiences and learn especially from this purport that at a certain point, we should decide to go back to Godhead and prepare for it. Because, I mean, the whole life should be a preparation for it. But at a certain point, one has to cut off all unnecessary activities and thoughts and desires and just focus on Krishna and, and going back to Godhead. So, <clears throat> therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that anyone who factually understands the transcendental appearance and disappearance of the Lord by his inconceivable energy becomes liberated from the laws of birth and death and is placed in the eternal spiritual sky where the Vaikuntha planets are. So in this purport, Prabhupada gives an amazing example comparing the appearance and disappearance of the sun to the appearance and disappearance of the Lord. Of course, the appearance and disappearance of the Lord is even much more amazing than the sun. But we, we have a material example of the sun, which is always shining. It's, it's, it's shining brightness does not stop at any time, but it appears like it appears and disappears in different places. But uh, at the same time, it's, it's uh, brilliant sunshine is shining. Just like uh, a few days ago, I was speaking to this one lady who comes to the farm and uh, she was asking a lot of spiritual questions to uh, Dhananjaya. And then I sort of came along and then I said, well, maybe I can ask you the question because uh, Dhananjaya, of course, gave good answers, but she needed a little bit more uh, explanation. So I said, okay, what, what is your question? So yes, she asked the question. And during the answer, I, I also brought up the question of the sun. I said, there's only one sun in the universe, although the astronomers and, and astrophysicists and those people, they say that uh, every star is a sun. I said, that's not actually true. And the proof is that when the sun so-called sets, all the stars appear in the sky. But yet, their light cannot dissipate the darkness of the night. And there's hundreds and millions of stars shining in, in, in nighttime. If they were all suns, why, why is there darkness? Because they, they are simply reflecting the light of the sun. They are not independent suns and being the source of light. And she said, wow, I, said, I never thought of that. Is that right, Donna Jai? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a brilliant explanation by Prabhupada. Where, uh, it's proof that the other stars are not actually suns. They simply reflect the light of the sun. Otherwise, there wouldn't be darkness at night with thousands of stars twinkling in the sky. They should be able to dissipate the darkness, but they don't. So one sun is illuminating everything. Now you could ask a question, well, if the sun is so bright, how come there's darkness in the universe? Very good question. Uh, it's because the light of the sun travels in mysterious ways also through electromagnetic waves and even though and which carry the energy of the sun all over the universe so therefore uh, the uh, so-called brightness is a subtle thing actually it's made up of infinite number of jivas which are like described in Brahma Samhita as pencils of light. So uh, how this is going on in the universe, there's still a mystery about it. How the light and energy is transferred from the sun 
to all the stars, uh, which are sometimes millions and millions of miles away. Uh, but yet, they reflect the light also. Okay, so uh, there are still many mysteries that we don't understand. We see them, but we don't understand exactly how they're functioning. So here Prabhupada says that Krishna is not forced to appear or disappear by any superior energy as living beings appear and disappear. Yeah, we're all being forced to uh, take birth in a body, and the body is chosen for us based on our previous karma. And we're being forced to leave the body also. So it says here that the mission of the Lord's appearance and disappearance in the mortal universe is completely dependent on his supreme will. He's not forced to appear or disappear by any superior energy. As the living beings appear and disappear, being forced by the laws of nature. Whenever the Lord likes, he can appear himself from anywhere and everywhere without disturbing his appearance and disappearance in any other place. He is like the sun. The sun appears and disappears on its own accord at any place without disturbing its presence in other places. The sun appears in the morning in India without disappearing from the Western Hemisphere. The sun is present everywhere and anywhere all over the solar system. But it also appears that in a particular place, the sun appears in the morning and also disappears at some fixed time in the evening. The time limitation even of the sun is of no concern, and so what to speak of the Supreme Lord, who is the creator and controller of the sun. This is an amazing example that Prabhupada gives. You start with the known to understand the unknown. You start with something that you can see and experience, and this gives you an idea of, uh, of Krishna's infinite and and uh, what you so, say, mysterious powers. So here Prabhupada gives an ex amazing example. <clears throat> so anyone who can understand factually the transcendental appearance and disappearance of the Lord by his inconceivable energy becomes liberated from the laws of birth and death. So the, the problem is uh, uh, that we try and and impose on Krishna our own limitations. We say, well, he appears and disappears, I appear and disappear, uh, it's the same thing. But it's not the same thing. Manyate atman atman jagat. That is, that is a Vedic aphorism that says that man tries to impose on God his own limitations not understanding that God has inconceivable potencies and can do things that even may appear like mundane activities, but they're not. And they're not regulated by the laws of karma or by the laws of nature. So unless we accept that, we remain an atheist. And many people don't accept that. They say, look, I appear and disappear. You say Krishna appears and disappears. What's the difference between him and me? It's the same thing. He's also subject to the laws of nature. So that is the Atmavan Manyate Jagat, trying to impose on Krishna one's own limited uh, potencies, uh, but it's not a fact. Krishna has inconceivable energies. And he can do things that look normal, but are not normal. And we have to accept that. If we don't, we remain an atheist. Shila Prabhupada ki je or is Shila Prabhupada any question? Yes. The, the, no, the no, the astronomers and astrophysicists they claim that there are, every star is a sun. Of course, but they don't see that difference. Well, I mean, and something is obvious to us because we're reading Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, but 
the materialistic people, they have, imp well, what is it? Imperfect senses. They make mistakes, easily illusion, and they have a cheating propensity. So their interpretation of things are not always, or are mostly incorrect all the time almost. Sometimes they get a few things right, and, but most of the time they get the they get them wrong because of atmavan manyate jagat. They impose on Krishna their own foibles or their own limit, limited uh, way of acting and seeing. And therefore, uh, they, uh, they make mistakes. And then they're illusioned when they believe that the mistake is true and they have imperfect senses and they have a cheating propensity. So here Prabhupada, and, and even in Bhagavad Gita, he explains about the sun. Um, says in the, he says, uh, 15th chapter, 12th verse in the purport. From this verse, that verse is uh, Yad Aditya Gatam Tejo Jagat Vasayate Kilam Yats Chandra Masi Yats Chagno Tat Tejo Vidi Mamakam. The splendor of the sun, which dissipates the darkness of this whole world, comes from me. And the splendor of the moon and the splendor of fire are also from me. And Prabhupada says in a purport, from this verse, we can understand that the sun is illuminating the whole solar system. There are different universes and solar systems, and there are different suns, moons, and planets also. But in each universe, there's only one sun. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 10.21, the moon is one of the stars, nakshat ranam aham shashi. Sunlight is due to the spiritual effulgence in the spiritual sky of the Supreme Lord. So there it is right there. That sunlight that we're seeing every day, that's coming from the Brahma Jyoti. Fire, uh, so many things are done with the help, uh, so it says, sunlight is due to the spiritual fulgence in the spiritual sky of the Supreme Lord. With the rise of the sun, the activities of human beings are set up. They set fire to prepare their foodstuff. They set fire to start the factory, etc. So many things are done with the help of fire. Therefore, sunrise, fire, and moonlight are so pleasing to the living entities. Without their help, no living entity can live. So if one can understand that the light and splendor of the sun, moon, and fire are emanating from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, then one's Krishna consciousness will begin. By the moon sign, all the vegetables are nourished. The moonshine is so pleasing that people can easily understand that they are living by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Without his mercy, there cannot be sun. Without his mercy, there cannot be moon. And without his mercy, there cannot be fire. And without the help of sun, moon, and fire, no one can live. These are some thoughts to provoke Krishna consciousness in the conditioned soul. So because you've read this, it's perfectly logical that it's only one sun, because it's said in the, by Srila Prabhupada, and, and, Shastra and Brahma Samhita. You see, but the, uh, the materialists, including astrophysicists and astronomers, they don't read Bhagavad Gita. They don't accept Prabhupada's purports. So how are they going to understand? They can only accept what their imperfect senses tell them and their speculation tell them. Nothing more than that. But that's the problem. Why? What seems to be perfectly rational to you is, is irrational to them. Like, for example, if you read about how Darwin came up with his theory of evolution of species, you see it's all speculation based on imperfect observation. And uh, he uh, came up with a theory because he was angry at God because he prayed to God. He was a Christian. He prayed to God that. When one of his daughters became very sick, he prayed to God that his daughter, please don't let her die. And she died. So after that, he stopped praying to God. He said, this is all nonsense. There's no God. There's just the cruelty of nature. 
that's all I'm observing. So he was, you know, observing wildlife on the uh, east coast of Africa for five years, going island to island and mainland. And all he saw was, you know, snakes eating little innocent mice and rats. And he saw big fish eating little fish. And he saw bigger insects eating little insects. And he came to the conclusion is that, you know, that there is horror in nature. There's nothing nice about it. It's all horrible. The, the big fish eats the little fish. And, and I prayed to God and my daughter died. Therefore, I don't believe in God. And I just see that nature is cruel and horrible. And I'm going to do something to destroy faith in God. So he wrote, he came up with this theory of evolution of species where there's no mention of God involved in it. It's all mechanical. And, of course, a lot of dumbbells accepted it. And now, today, it's accepted as science, although it's junk. And it's taught to your kids. It was taught to you, in fact. Right? Did you learn about Darwin's theory in, in, in India? You didn't learn in India? Nobody learned in India. Any of you learned it in India? You did, yeah. What school did you go to? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no factual basis to it at all. It's all speculation. And there's no, there's, no, there's no factual proof, although they say they have proof. But when they explain what their so-called proof is, it's not proof. It's just speculation. So this is the problem, that uh, speculation is okay. They teach kids to speculate in school. It's part of the, their so-called scientific process. And we're trying to teach people not to speculate. So it's, it's very, uh, one time I was with Prabhupada, I told this before, and we were talking, and at one point he says, he said, the karmis see everything backwards. He shook his hand like, <laughs> like this. And he said, uh, they see everything backwards. They don't see properly. So that's the point, you know, if, if we say, Krishna has inconceivable energies. They, they say, well, I don't even believe in Krishna. So why should I believe that there's inconceivable energy? But yet, they're seeing inconceivable energies all the time in nature. All the time. They're, they're puzzled by it. Darwin also called the mystery, he said, the mystery of, of uh, creation and, and, uh, and the, all the different species. He called it a mystery. And then he, because it's a mystery, he come, comes up with some fantastical speculation trying to explain the mystery. And then later on, it's accepted as science. But there's no basis to it at all. Because they don't mention at all the soul. They just talk about the body. The whole theory of Darwin's evolution of species is about the body. There's no mention of a soul. So therefore, they don't understand. And if you read Bhagavad Gita, you'll see, right? In many places, but in the seventh chapter, Yanam Teham Chabigyanam, Idam Vaksyam Yasei Sataha, Yajgadva Nehab Yuhu Nyaj, Gatavyam Avasishyate. It's the second verse. It says, I shall now declare unto you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and numinous, this being known, nothing further shall remain for you to know. And in the purport, in the first line of purport, Prabhupada explains, complete knowledge includes knowledge of the phenomenal world, the spirit behind it, and the source of both of them. This is transcendental knowledge. So what is Darwin explaining in the theory of evolution? He's just explaining the phenomenal world. He's avoiding the spirit soul, and he's avoiding the origin of everything, or the source of both of them, the soul and the phenomenal world. So therefore, how can his theory be right? But he's avoiding the two other 
essential elements to understand completely reality. So, I rest my case. Hare Krishna. All glory is the seal of power. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Yes. That's in Bhagavad Gita also. <laughs>